morning. My name is Murray. Welcome here. It's 2019. Looking forward to getting to a new series. Just meditating and just thinking about the, the words of that, just that last song even, just, just makes you realize there's so much more going on that day on the cross than just might uh, just appear on the surface or what just seems at first glance. There's just so much happening, so much to behold, uh, and so much to, so much reality, that ultimate reality just streaming forth from what Jesus accomplished on the cross, this God who took on human flesh and then would, would uh, come and live the life we could never have lived and, and started from, the, from birth as a baby and then all the way to the point as uh, uh, becoming that, that sacrifice in our place just to purchase our redemption, our acceptance with God, our being able to be forgiven and received so that God could be just and accept us in a right way. There's just beholding the love, the grace, the justice, just so much just at the cross is just amazing. Just to, no wonder why Paul writes about the Christians, we make our boast in the cross. Yeah, we boast. There's our hope, our salvation. So today we are starting a new series, and we're actually going to be working through two letters that were written by a key leader in the Christian church, uh, a man named, named Paul. And he writes these letters to a young man, his co-laborer, uh, his apprentice, really, Timothy. And this, this uh, letter, this first letter that's written then to Timothy, really is for the church. In particular, it was for the church at, in Ephesus at that day. So this is a letter to Timothy for the church at Ephesus. But, but it's also truth that's needed by every gospel-centered local church until Jesus comes. And I have the joy of introducing this series, so we get to, I get to deliver the background and the setting. That should be fun, eh? <laughs> but I think it will be. There is so much there that, that I think understanding the, the setting, the background for setting up this series, actually I think there'll be a lot more for us even in that as we begin to tie on. And who knows, we might even get past the first word of the, of the actual letter. But uh, let's have our scripture. So Second Timothy, or First Timothy, rather, chapter one, verses one to eleven. We're going to cover. If you don't have a Bible, there still looks like a couple on the table. We'd love for you to make sure that you have a Bible so you can follow along with us, so you can see what it actually says yourself, or or, or pull up First uh, Timothy on your app as well. And so that you can follow along. We'll also put the scripture on the screen as well in the English Standard Version for you. So First Timothy chapter one. Here's our scripture. Reading from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1-11 to Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good, if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul really, he gives his purpose for writing this letter really in chapter 3, in the middle of the letter. He kind of nails what, what he's, he's focusing on, where he says in verse 14 of chapter 3, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that, in other words, for this reason, that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So notice he defines church as a household, right? Not something you attend, but actually a family to which you belong. 
And God designed the church then to represent the living God in the world. So to be a pillar and a buttress, in other words, an outpost. So the temples in those days, building, you'd have the, the pillars. That's what you would see visibly, and they would rest and provide for the whole structure. And so this would be this outpost of truth in a world of lies and false promises and false identities and, and self-centered purposes. The church is really designed then to be the gospel made visible. And the church is where the truth of the gospel of Jesus is taught. It's where it's lived out in both content and character. The church is where the Spirit's presence actually gives us a taste, a little foretaste of heaven on earth. And for this to happen, though, the church has to have its pillars centered on the rock bed truth of the gospel of Jesus. And if a church begins to drift away from the centrality of the gospel of Jesus and his amazing grace, then it will no longer function as God designed it to be and to do. Now, some of you have experienced church where the gospel of grace was no longer kept as the main thing, when the gospel was no longer central. And that's a church really with its heart ripped out. I guess we could call it a zombie church, right? And when you're a zombie church, what happens? You begin to bite and devour one another, kind of from within, like Paul writes to the church of Galatia, of which we're going to see where Timothy was from. And so uh, there's a lot of connecting points. In 1 Timothy, then, is written so that we might know how Paul writes it, how one ought to behave, or in other words, we'd probably say how life is to be lived in the household of God in a local church. So as we go through this letter, we're going to see what God says a healthy church looks like. How is a healthy church to be structured? And, and it, it's not a question you often hear people ask, right? In other words, what does God actually prescribe as opposed to what do I prefer? And what does he call the church to be as opposed to what am I looking for in a church? In other words, what does God himself say about what we're supposed to be about. Now, some of you in here I know are perfectionists. And you're going to have to repent of that. Right? Because perfectionists, you're not fun to be around. Because not only do we not meet your expectations, but you don't meet your own expectations. Right? You're unhappy with yourself. You're unhappy with everything you do because you're not perfect either. So, First thing we do want to do, even as we look at this, is you want to put that dream of perfection to death. What we want to aim at, though, is being healthy. We want to aim at being healthy, because you're never going to be perfect. Jesus alone stands perfect, but your aim should be to be healthy. Now, this will never be a perfect church, but we're not actually aiming to be a perfect church. What we are aiming for it to be, though, is to be healthy, warts and all. 1 Timothy talks a lot about a church in the terms of health. It, it uses images like false teaching, spreading like gangrene. How's that for an image? Right? And we're going to learn that to be healthy as a church, we need to be centered on Jesus' gospel and his priorities. So as we, as we work through this book, we're going to hopefully see maybe where we as a church need to realign some things, or we need to maybe make some repairs so that we can actually have God's intended beauty in the church to be restored or to be kind of resurfaced, redone. And we're going to learn in this book, this letter really too, that doctrine really matters. And doctrine is what we, what we believe, right? So it's what we believe about God, what we believe about us, what we believe regarding our purpose in life, that all matters. And so this letter is going gonna, is gonna to give us not just truth to live by, but actually truth to help us thrive, to thrive. By the time we finish this, this series, this study, I really hope that we're going to have a higher view of the church, because that's needed by many in our culture. And you're going to find some of the points in your take-home sheet. You've got an outline, much of which we're not going to get to cover. It's too big a bite, but you can at least have some of the points there you can follow. And there's some scriptures there you can study up later on just to hopefully just grow our love for the church that Jesus loved and gave himself for. He died to create. And I really believe that this will be a series through First and Second Timothy that is going to be very relevant for us at this time. And then if you saw the, in the video there about the Acts... Um, 
29 global gathering that we have in July. We're going to be going through 2 Timothy there. So then I can learn about all the mistakes we did in teaching it here to you ahead of time. So we'll get to see where we kind of were off the mark. But, but we have to remember that though this letter is written to Timothy, and it's written in particular for the church at Ephesus, yet it's both the Holy Spirit's intent and Paul's intent that it doesn't stop there. It actually designed to even minister to us as a local church on Jesus' mission in 2019. And the first clue even you get of that, because you think about Paul writing this to his, his close friend and, and co-laborer, Timothy, and yet look at how he starts the letter. Like, you're not going to give, he doesn't need to give Timothy that formal greeting like that, okay? But he does that. That becomes our first hint. But you'll see as, the, as it goes unfold, if, as we go through it, that we're going to see this is for more than just the church at Ephesus. This was designed to be for the church down through the ages, and 1 Timothy is going to address the gracious privilege that it is to belong to a church, as well as he wants to help us see our purpose so that we can meaningfully function as the church together that's formed by the gospel and for the gospel. So in this letter, Paul's going to talk about, he's going to talk about prayer, he's going to talk about how the church should treat widows, he's going to talk about relationships and how those function within the church, he's going to talk about uh, leadership, uh, how does that work, he's going to talk about the, the roles of men and women in the church, not that anyone cares about that topic in this day and age, but this book will cover it anyway, right? It's going to warn us about needless controversies speculations, legalism, greed, handling conflict, being faithful. It's going to remind us of our own weakness and the grace that has been shown us so it would stir up in us that first love again. So 1 Timothy is a book just filled with gospel hope. So let's begin. We'll at least get to the first word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So now this Paul, the writer then of the letter, is, is, he was originally named Saul. And Saul was the name of the first king of Israel. And it was a very fitting name then for this man because he was a proud, self-righteous Pharisee. And so, and Saul was his name. In, in Acts chapter 9, we look there and we see that, that we learn that Paul, or Saul as he was known as then, he wasn't always a Christian. In fact, Saul so hated Jesus, and he believed that anyone who claimed to worship Jesus as God, as Lord, should be put to death, because he considered it blasphemy to really claim that this man, or in fact any man, could actually be God come in the flesh. For a human to claim to be God, he just saw that as blasphemy. So he saw Jesus as just the leader of some cult, a cult leader who was very dangerous. And the conversion of Paul, him becoming a Christian, really is one of the greatest arguments for the actual resurrection of Jesus. Because Paul is not a guy who's going to flip teams easily, or at all. But yet, it happens in Acts chapter 9, where he's actually on his way to arrest more Christians. So Jesus, who at this point has now died on the cross for his church, he has risen from the dead, and he has ascended back into heaven, seated on the throne at his Father's right hand, but Jesus so loves his church, so intimately identifies with his people that he gets off the throne, comes down, makes a cameo appearance to knock Paul on his butt. He confronts him and he says, why are you persecuting me? Did you hear that? Jesus so loves and identifies with his church that to hate and persecute the church is to poke Jesus right in the apple of his eye. That's what he thinks of us as his church. He takes it personally. The church is his bride. The church is his body on the earth. And in that moment, Paul realizes he was the one who was in the wrong. Paul realizes that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Why? Why? 
because he's right there. He's just been confronted. He suddenly realizes Jesus is who he claimed to be because he's encountered the risen, glorified Jesus. And so Paul, realizing he's in big trouble, he taps out. He is converted. His whole life changes. He goes from being a man who hates and murders Christians to being a pastor and ambassador of Jesus and telling everyone that he, he can about the love and grace of Jesus to him. And you know, Paul gets beat up by, probably beat up more than anyone else in the Bible, right? He's truly converted as a follower of Jesus. It cost him everything. I mean, every comfort he had, his position, his power, his money, his family, his friends, he lost it all. And that makes no sense at all unless he actually witnessed and was confronted by the risen Jesus himself. And Paul went on to say, he says, pain, fatigue, all the cost of following Jesus, none of these things move me. I just want to finish my course. Why? Because he looked forward to the finish and he saw Jesus standing at the end. And that's the one he wanted to, to know and to love and to be with. So after becoming a Jesus follower, Saul changes his name to Paul as he identifies himself in the letter. And Paul means little. It means small. Because now, instead of being named after the, the great, large, first great, proud king of Israel, he now calls himself small. He's just small in his own eyes. He's been humbled by the gospel. And so we see the grace that God has shown him just has so melted his heart. And so we see that he calls himself, even in this letter, before this first chapter is done, he's going to call himself the, the chief of sinners, the foremost of sinners, the worst of sinners. Paul is chosen then, he is taught by, he's sent out by the risen Jesus himself. And that's what apostle means. It means he's, a, he's an official sent one. He's a delegated agent to represent another. In this case, Christ Jesus. Christ means the anointed one, Messiah. Hebrew, Christ is more the Greek for he's the anointed one, the appointed Savior, Jesus which means God who saves. And Paul becomes a church planter. And one of the places Paul goes in his church planting uh, mission is to a city called Lystra. And Lystra is in what was then the Roman province of Galatia. It's now in south-central Turkey. And that's where Timothy is from. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 16. And when Paul went to Lystra, he told, basically told the people that the gods they were worshiping were worthless. They were false. That gets you beat up. So they stoned Paul, and when he got up with whatever bones weren't broken yet, he went on and the very next day to preach about Jesus in the next town, Derby. And then he came back to Lystra preaching the gospel. And Timothy, who was from Lystra, heard Paul passionately preach the gospel in love to a people who actually hated him. Timothy's dad was a, a Greek. He was not a believer. We don't know what actually happened to him. We don't know, did he just take off? Is he dead? Um, whatever happened to his dad, though, he was not in Timothy's life. So as Timothy grew up, he grew up basically raised by, by a godly grandma and a single mom. And, and though he had a believing grandma and, and mom who taught him actually about Jesus from the scriptures from, the, from an early age, it, it seems that Timothy, though, was not actually converted until Acts chapter 14, when as a young man, somewhere probably between the ages of 18 and 20, through the preaching of Paul, he comes to understand and believe and put his trust in Jesus. So Timothy was born again and spiritually uh, raised up through the teaching then and shepherding of Paul and then continued on in the church at Lystra. And, and several years later in Acts chapter 16, Timothy, who's now growing into this faithful, godly young man, He's, he's known, he's faithfully serving in his local church at Lystra, and, and Paul takes him on and then invests in him as a church planting apprentice, an intern, because he's seen the character and, and his servant heart, and he's been known and recognized and, and affirmed by his church family at Lystra. So they basically say, yes, 
You know, we've seen him journey. We've been journeying through him and his faithfulness. So the church affirms really his character and his faithfulness. And so Paul and Timothy basically uh, begin and journey. They're in this Jesus ministry together, kind of like Batman and Robin. You know, they are, they are a duo that you're going to see them very close. And Paul really was a spiritual father to Timothy. And they didn't just have a working relationship. It was truly a love relationship, right? They had love for Jesus, love for his mission, and they had a love for one another. Timothy was a faithful young man who could take one for the team. He was so dedicated to the mission of pointing people to Jesus that he got circumcised by Paul in order to gain access to the Jewish community. He did not get circumcised to, be, to please God or to be accepted by God. He was fully accepted by God through the work of Jesus. But he did this in order to gain access to the Jewish community who would not accept him, knowing that his father had been a, an unbelieving Greek. Now, that's devotion, right? He was willing to do whatever it took to tear down any man-made barriers to get the message of the gospel out there. Now, that's not a part of our intern program. We did have a few interns drop off, right? Potentially, I thought we were going to get a few more interns, but I happened to mention it was going to be like a Paul Timothy type relationship. I don't know if that's why they broke into a cold sweat, maybe, and said, well, maybe I should pray about it. Maybe I think God's calling me to be a plumber, you know? And maybe it was because I happened to be holding a knife, but I was just cutting sandwiches. <laughs> My timing is always bad. That's how communication breaks down. But Timothy, we do know this, he was committed to the gospel mission. He didn't seek to be the number one guy. He just sought to be a faithful minister of the gospel as part of a team. So Paul took the newly circumcised Timothy along with him. And when Paul, he was there with Paul then when, when he planted the church at Ephesus. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 19. At that time, Ephesus was, was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It proximately had the population of Saskatoon. So think the same population, but just it was condensed and packed into a smaller area. But, but the city of Ephesus was the population of Saskatoon. It was the capital city, actually, of the New Asia in Paul's day. It was a trade center. It was an educational hub. It had one of the largest libraries in the world. And people would often come then to Ephesus. Sometimes they would stay there for a while for education purposes, different things. They'd be there for a season, and then they'd move on. And so people from all over the world would come to Ephesus. It was a real multicultural center. And not only that, it was diverse economically. You had the very rich and you had some of the very poor, sometimes living almost right side by side in that city. It was a spiritual place. There was over 50 different religions that had their main temples there. It was a highly sexualized culture. Uh, sex was simply seen as a natural biological act, not a covenant act. And sexual desire was not to be suppressed. Prostitution was big business. It was even part of many of the religions that were there. Homosexuality was common. Gender differences, roles was all blurred. What a city in which to plant healthy churches. A church there could really impact a lot of people and a lot of places. Not unlike Saskatoon. And when Paul and his team came to Ephesus, they found there there was this kind of core group of about 12 men, and they had been desirous to follow Jesus. They were trying to learn about and trying to follow Jesus. There were some things they knew, but, but they had not yet been baptized by the Spirit. And then the Spirit is poured out on these guys, and Paul begins to recognize, well, God is doing something in this city. And so he stays in fact, after three months, he actually rents a hall. He rents a hall there for two years, and he begins to teach all the disciples and all those who come to faith. They have this time, and, and he's teaching both Jews and Greeks there together. And he ends up staying in the city for close to three and a half years. And it's here in Ephesus, you can read about that in Acts 19 as well. You'll see there's some itinerant ghostbusters um, they want in actually on Jesus' power without actually submitting to Jesus. So these seven guys, these local seven Jewish exorcists, the sons of Sceva, 
they try to cast out a demon from some guy, and, and the demon-possessed guy goes, you know, Jesus I know, and, and I've heard of Paul, but who are you guys? And then the guy jumps on them, overpowers the seven ghostbusters, and they end up beat up and bloodied with no clothes on, which is a little humiliating to say the least, right? Because when I'm in a fight, I at least want to come away with my clothes on. As a result of this, though, the gossip about Jesus and about Paul and the small church that's just beginning there starts to spread through the city. And the news comes about that Jesus is to be feared. He's to be feared. However, the resistance to the gospel message in Ephesus, though, is really strong. But Paul, he just persists. He's going to be faithful. He's going to preach about the person and work of Jesus. And what happens is people start coming to faith. They start turning from their superstitious ways. In fact, there's a scene where a whole bunch of them gather together. They burn their old religious and incantation and self-help books. And they burn their religious icons and idols that they have. Millions of dollars worth if you convert it. Hopefully, they weren't library books that they checked out. But, but Jesus had become more valuable to them than their stuff. And that's because, as Tim Keller said, Jesus is the only God whom when you obtain him will satisfy you and when you fail him will forgive you. And Timothy, he was there with Paul. When you read about that, he was there with Paul during that whole time. And Paul then eventually sends Timothy on to Macedonia to continue ministering to the new churches there. And eventually a riot breaks out. There's a whole thing and Paul is forced out of the city. And so eventually he joins with Timothy and the rest of the team and others there in Macedonia. And that's all in Acts chapter 19. You can read about it there. It's fantastic. And, and later when Paul's headed to Jerusalem with a gift to the suffering saints there, he stops, he calls for the, the elders of the church at Ephesus. And there's this great scene where you just... Uh, Paul just sort of reaffirms the thing that he's been teaching them, tries to center them back on the gospel, and you just see the love between Paul and the elders of this church at Ephesus. But in that time that he's there, he gives the church this prophetic warning. This is in Acts chapter 20, you know, verse 29, in the middle of what Paul is sharing with them. He says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, he's not talking about wolves and sheep, right? He's talking about false teachers and the church. And he says, from among your own selves. So he said, this is going to happen right from within you, right from within your own church, right? It's going to arise men speaking twisted things, right? Something that's twisted. In other words, it's close to the truth, but it's, it's twisted, it's, it's, it's bent. Now, if you are new to Christianity, it's important for you to learn that not all that calls itself Christian is Christian. And wolves who here identify themselves as Christian, and they identify themselves as representing Jesus, and they even claim to be teaching Jesus truth, but they're actually teaching twisted things. So you do need to be careful. And that's why, in fact, why we want you to have a copy of the Bible when we go through the series and why we teach the Bible. We want you to have the app out. We want you to check. Because we want you to see what does it actually say. Because I don't want you to ever take my word for granted. In fact, even good people can get it wrong. And so we want to be examining, say, and we want to be looking to the scripture itself to say, hey, is this what this says? And to see that, we want to, to have that. Because there's the possibility, whether sincerely or insincerely, of teaching twisted things. Things that are not true, not completely centered on what's real. And then it says, they do this in this case, he says, to draw away the disciples after them. In other words, rather than pointing people and directing people to Jesus as their hope, they're becoming the Savior, right? In other words, it's making it about them rather than making it about Jesus. So that's one mark 
you can see of one who's twisting the truth of a potential wolf is they're making it, they're trying to draw disciples after themselves rather than disciples of Jesus. And he says, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. He spoke the truth in love. So the tears emphasizing, man, he really loved and cared for these people. Paul loved this church. And his warning, though, did come to pass. Because if you fast forward 10 years from that moment, which takes you several years past the end of the book of Acts, Paul has now been released from prison, which where we found him at the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28. Remember, he was imprisoned in Rome, but he was released after that. He's back on his church planting mission. And then as he returns to check in with his beloved church at Ephesus, he's found out that wolves from within had actually begun damaging the church distracted it from its mission, it had drifted from sound doctrine and the centrality of the gospel, and that's why Timothy is sent to go and stay in Ephesus to help get things set right. And Paul wants this church to not only start the race, but actually finish it. Because if you, if you don't finish in the faith, then your starting's all for naught. You don't want to be a one-hit wonder that just disappears off the map. Call me maybe. Um, This once city-impacting, Jesus-loving church got inward-focused. Where once they had seen the gospel go forth in power, they saw people getting saved, where the truth of the word of God was being proclaimed and responded to, they lost their first love. They lost their awe of God. They lost the wonder of his love. Law and legalism, not love, not the gospel, was now shifting to the front. Leadership was corrupt. They weren't following God's pattern nor his heart. It became about power and personal gain. People had their own agendas. Their focus became, but what's in it for me? Greed motivated their hearts. What's in it for me? Generosity was gone. Gossip was rampant, right? They they weren't praying for the lost. Much damage to the reputation of Jesus was being caused by this once healthy church that was now very sick. And when secondary things are promoted and elevated above primary things, it's devastating. But it shouldn't surprise us to see the gospel being attacked and distorted in the church because the church has an adversary, a spiritual enemy who focuses his attack on the gospel. And Satan uses people. And sometimes, and maybe sometimes even especially, those who are in leadership roles. And with social media, today, false teaching can spread like gangrene. So Timothy is going to have to actually remove some leaders. And you you know what that's going to do, right? He's going to have to appoint some new leaders. And it was going to be a messy situation because this is going to be challenged because there are people who love those false teachers because they teach the things they want to hear that appeal to their own flesh, that scratches where they itch. And so it's going to create a lot of conflict and difficulty to try to get this church back on a healthy spot and get some leaders then who are, who are Jesus shepherds actually leading and shepherding the church. But one thing we can learn this is don't idolize the early church. I mean, they had lots of problems as well. You know, here at Grace, I think we've been moving generally in a fairly relatively good direction, I feel, focusing on the gospel and on community and on our mission, but, but so is the church at Ephesus. And if that flourishing church, planted by Paul and Timothy and others like him, you know, if it could drift from its moorings within 10 years, you know, in 10 years it had drifted so far, then let's humble ourselves and let's take heed to the words of 1 Timothy so that we can continue to honor Jesus and to be a growing, maturing, and healthy church. 
Because I think it's really fitting for us to study this book now. Because we're now, as we said last week, we're celebrating eight years since our public launch. Then here is Grace Fellowship Saskatoon here in the theater. So this is going to be good for us. It's good for us to always continually be recalibrating. And so we want to do that before we get to be 10 years, as old as the church at Ephesus is at this point in time. So we would be kept from drifting from the gospel. And I pray that we'd learn these truths before we reach the point that is happening in that church there. Um, It's better to be preventative than to have to deal with a big gangrene mess. So back to verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Apostle. So he has a, now, there's two ways that word apostle is kind of used in the Bible. Uh, one, we, I'll call them, it, you won't see a capital there, but we'll call them capital A apostles. And those are ones who are chosen and designated by Jesus himself. And these individuals were granted this particular gifting and authority to lay the foundation of the church with Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. So these are apostles of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus. They were taught directly by the risen Jesus. They were sent out and empowered by the Spirit to bring the ongoing teaching of Jesus. Just like Jesus said what was going to happen, he told them in his upper room discourse before going to the cross, that his disciples would be enabled by the Spirit to bring us Jesus' continued teaching, which is what we have written here in the New Testament scriptures. And then secondly, there is what I would term small A apostles, and these are sent ones of the church. So they're apostles recognized and sent by the church on the mission of planting new gospel-centered churches. So we're sending Sam uh, out as a small a apostle. He's a sent one of the church, right? A church planter, recognized, appointed, and sent. He's not a capital A apostle. He wasn't an eyewitness. He's not that old. I'm the old one, right? He's not an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. He wasn't taught or commissioned directly from the Lord himself. And he's not writing new books of the Bible. So if Sam writes you a letter, be encouraged, right? Learn, but don't add First and Second Sam to your Bible. <laughs> he's a small a apostle. And, and we see in verse 1 that this was by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. So Paul was commanded to be an apostle by God. Right? It wasn't something he simply decided to do, right? like you do with a career. But more than that, I think he is saying that what he has written here was by commandment of God our Savior and from Christ Jesus our hope. So he's making it clear that this letter, the things he writes here, this is not his own thoughts, his own ideas, his own opinions. Right? It's not the mere words of a man but of God. And Paul wrote this in other places too, like 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, not just as my thoughts, my preferences, my ideas, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And the word used here in 1 Timothy 1.1 by commandment is actually a word that means a royal commandment. It refers to a commandment from a monarch or a king, which is non-negotiable. So there are things in this letter, because the church of Ephesus is in disarray with a lot of pushback, that Paul makes it clear these things come from from orders from on high commanded by the sovereign of the universe. So these things cannot be written off as simply prejudices or preferences of Paul. So as we consider Timothy too, 
There's a lot about him I think we're going to be able to relate to as we go through this series because we can get the idea in our heads, not from the Bible, but in our heads, that these are not regular people. These are Bible people. But when we look at Timothy, we're going to see a very ordinary guy. He's not the bold, unshakable, type A personality Paul. Timothy's got this tendency to be fearful, anxious. He needs encouragement. He can feel overwhelmed. He's got a weak stomach. He's got some health problems. And though he had traveled and served alongside Paul for 10 years, Ephesus was a pretty big leadership task. And he was young, probably just in his late 20s by now. And I'm sure Timothy was tempted to bail and take the first train out of town. But in all his weakness, he has a devotion and desire to be faithful because he loves Jesus. Now imagine to be overwhelmed in this mess of a church at Ephesus, feeling you're out of your league, you're scared, you're weak, and then a messenger comes and hands you this scroll from Paul that says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, Imagine how that was encouraging me. Oh, yes, I've been sent here by Paul. He trusts Jesus can work in me and through me by his spirit. And more than Paul, from God our Savior, from the head of the church, Christ Jesus, our hope himself. God is our Savior, not me. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved in our salvation. Together, as the one God, they masterminded the gracious, merciful salvation where we put our hope not in ourselves, but in our Lord Jesus. And imagine Timothy, who grew up without a father figure, hear Paul say this to Timothy, my true child in the faith. And how would this have sounded coming from this faithful man, Paul, capital A apostle, um, appointed by God's own anointed Savior to say grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Paul wants to center him and all of us who are hearing this on the gospel right away. And so he gives them right in this, in this introduction, he just gives them this brief summary right here. It all starts with grace, he said. Grace, that's God's unobligated, undeserved favor. And God's unobligated, undeserved love. And God's unobligated and undeserved forgiveness to the guilty in and through Jesus. Paul loves grace. In fact, he uses the word grace over a hundred times in his New Testament writings. We took his lead. We named named our church grace. So grace is receiving the absolute favor of God that you don't deserve. And then the other side of the same gospel coin is mercy. Mercy is not receiving the judgment and misery you do deserve. And then peace is is the glorious result of God's grace and mercy to us in Jesus. Peace speaks of the reconciliation that we who were alienated from God have now freely received and brought together that we now have fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then all these terms are written in a tense that means continual, ongoing actions So there's ongoing, continual grace, which we need because we need to both receive and to extend it continually. There's ongoing and continual mercy. Mercies are new every morning. And there's ongoing, continual peace and acceptance forever and ever, which is why we never get past the gospel. We never get past the gospel. So even in the messiness of trials from outside, temptations from within, brokenness, mess in the church, we have hope because we have the love and the attention and the focus of Jesus. We belong to Jesus. He's reminding Timothy and us. And hope, do you see that in verse 1? Hope is a person. Jesus, who is our hope. In the midst of uncertainty, 
the midst of fears, weakness, turmoil, personal conflicts, all the things that that are going to be having to, Timothy's going to have to deal with in the church, he reminds him, our future is secure. This is our hope in Jesus, who is for us, who is for us. So all of these, this hope that's based on grace, mercy, and peace, they flow from someone. Who's that? It flows from God our Father. Come to us in Jesus, who is our hope. It's all assured to us by his Spirit. So Paul wants Timothy and us to know and be assured of the love and acceptance and the grace of the Father in which we stand. So I think this series ought to be good. And we'll get into it next, next, next uh, week. Father, we just thank you for the words of this book and that we have it in writing so that we can be assured of what's true and we can be certain of who you are and and what's not twisted, and what is the pure, straight truth. And ultimately, that truth we know is bound up in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that in and through this Jesus, we can be brought into a full place of acceptance and uh, be received by you, and be living then in the love, the glorious, gracious love of the Father, and having favor and acceptance with you. And so we thank you for the gospel. Lord, May we learn much from this. May we continually recalibrate and get centered back again on the truth of the gospel message of your character, who you are, and what you have done for us in and through Jesus, through his cross work, his resurrection, his ascension to your right hand as the Lord of lords and the King of all kings. And we're so grateful to belong to you. So help us, Lord. We need your direction. We need your wisdom. Apart from you, we can do nothing. So we look to you to continue this gospel work that you've begun. We thank you for the grace and mercy you've shown us that's now brought us peace with you, God. No longer under condemnation, but now beloved children of a God most high. Amazing. May our church be brought to a unity in the gospel that brings you much honor and brings us much joy as we seek and learn from your words in the coming weeks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.